The Outer Banks are mere spits of sand pressed against the power of the Atlantic Ocean. It's awesome. The power is awesome. These islands are a natural treasure. It's a beautiful place. And they're a national treasure. We like the lighthouses uh, and uh, we love to go to the beach. So do millions of other people. Everyone get together and smile. They come from all over. New York, Delaware, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio. They spend hundreds of millions of dollars. This place would basically dry up if we didn't have the tourism industry here. But the tourism industry and the livelihoods of most people here depend on this aging bridge. Man, I can peel off a chunk of concrete here that's four inches. And an industry that depends on this two-lane highway. It's always a concern to us because it's our link to the rest of the world. Scientists say there's reason for concern. They say if storm activity and rising sea levels continue at the current rate, the Outer Banks could go from this to this in our lifetime. Those parts of the islands that, that collapse will not have uh, paved roads on them because it's going to be water. But will science steer public policy towards a solution? I'm not sure that the political realities uh, necessarily work that way. Some see Highway 12 as a symbol of the challenge facing all of our state's barrier islands. We're not big enough to, to, to deal with a, a war against the ocean. But the state's been fighting the ocean to hold this line for decades. It's a symbol of an uncertain future and a metaphor for the political stalemate over what to do about it. I think it's definitely a line in the sand. From WRAL News, this is Focal Point. About three million people visit the Outer Banks every year. It's easy to see why. It is beautiful here, and there's so much history, like the Wright Brothers Memorial and, of course, the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, icons for both our state and our nation. But scientists say these Outer Banks are being threatened by erosion and rising sea level. They say major sections could be underwater within our lifetime. Our focal point, the future of the Outer Banks, and what our state has to lose if those scientists are right. The Earth and its oceans are always in motion, sculpting bands of sand called barrier islands. Perhaps none are so beautiful as the Outer Banks. I could just sit here and li listen to the waves all day. Walter and Kathy Mack of Chapel Hill join their children and grandchildren here for a summer vacation every year. We just love everything about it. We think that uh, it's a national treasure here. We've really enjoyed it over the last nine years that we've, uh, we've come here. The surf is great today. One of the Mack's daughters and her husband <laughs> drive eight hours to get here, even though the Jersey Shore is only 90 minutes from their home in Pennsylvania. I love the blue water here. The waves are a lot better and... The beach is cleaner. Oh, much cleaner. So, I mean, you don't have to make your decision on whether you're going to go to the beach today as to whether or not the bacteria count is too high. I mean, nobody thinks about that here. Like millions of others who visit the Outer Banks, the Mack family spends a lot of money here. Bathing suits and hats and flip-flops. And go to the restaurants, of course. There's no better place to get a, a good seafood dinner than in this area. We did the uh, the hang gliding Hang lesson. gliding, that's right. We've been kayaking, parasail, up at Kitty Hawk. So we do our fair share of spending. We contribute to the economy. A dollar seventy is your change. Thank you. The Macs aren't alone. People from all over the United States are coming here. Tourism officials say visitors spend more than seven hundred million dollars a year along the Outer Banks and millions in taxes from those sales flow to state and local government. Just need plenty of sunscreen, that's all. The Mack family contributes to that economic flow, but they also know how easily it can go. The fact that we're thrust out here well into the water uh, on nothing more than a strip of moving sand is, is pretty incredible. And then the other area is Oregon Inlet. Coastal geologist Stan Riggs knows what those moving strips of sand mean to tourism and tourism is a big part of, of the economy of eastern North Carolina. And we can't let that go away. But Rick says it's also important to understand that barrier islands are part of an important ecosystem. We can't just use them as an economic cash register. 
If they're an economic cash register that's just counting the dollars, then we'll lose those resources. Next, are we already losing them? Are the outer banks disappearing? They're all in the process of collapsing as we speak. You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News. In-depth coverage you can count on. You can't visit all of the wonderful places on the Outer Banks without traveling Highway 12. It connects us to the communities here and connects the communities to each other. But in many ways, Highway 12 is like a line in the sand that can easily be washed away by the sea, and often is. Some say it's more than an inconvenience. It's a sign of a much more serious problem. A good restaurant there, down under. The Mack family uses Highway 12 to get on and around the Outer Banks. They have a tough job trying to keep that Oregon Inlet open. As they've traveled the highway over the years, they've seen the signs of its vulnerability. There's just a very narrow area that you can, that the road goes through and you see the sand washing over the road. You can see the, the gaps in the dunes where there have been uh, washes that have come through and we've seen more than than we've ever seen in the past. I have seen changes definitely in the roads. They, the areas have gotten narrower. The narrowing is not her imagination. That's Highway 12 going to sea right there. Stan Riggs has been documenting it for years. He says this section north of Buxton has been narrowing at a rate of seven feet a year on the ocean side and one foot a year on the sound side. There are places where you can almost spit across the island now. Riggs says efforts to protect the highway from the narrowing just make the narrowing worse. It's because of the nature of barrier islands. They're ephemeral components and they come and go. And they are going right now as demonstrated by our inability to keep Highway 12 uh, in one place very long. Overwash and inlets naturally move sand to the backside of barrier islands, allowing them to build along that backside. We have to understand those dynamics and so far we haven't done a very good job at working with them. Rick says just look south to uninhabited Portsmouth Island to see what happens when that process is allowed to happen. It is high and wide and naturally in very good condition. The state tries to protect Highway 12 by rebuilding dunes. It also closes inlets open by storms to rebuild the highway. Riggs says both of those activities stop the natural rebuilding of the barrier island. They need inlets, they need overwash, they need to be allowed to do their thing or they're going to collapse. It's a problem right there. Riggs says sections of the Outer Banks are already collapsing. This map shows the Outer Banks today. Riggs and his colleagues say if sea level continues to rise at the current rate and storm activity continues with the same or higher intensity as it has over the last 15 years, this is how the Outer Banks could look in a few decades. Major sections of Ocracoke and Hatteras Islands would be underwater. The big islands, the islands with lots of sand, high, wide mm -hmm. islands, the sand-rich islands, right. will be there. But not much else. Not much else. If this happens, there's going to be no Highway 12 right down there. That's one of the big problems that, highway, that DOT is trying to deal with right now. One of the biggest problems is just north of Hatteras Village. In September 2003, Hurricane Isabel opened an inlet here. The state spent $6 million closing the inlet and rebuilding that section of road. From the air, it's easy to see the many places where Highway 12 has been relocated over the years. We put a Band-Aid on them, but that Band-Aid isn't very good and it's not going to hold a whole lot. Since 1987, the state has spent nearly $50 million rebuilding the highway and rebuilding dunes to protect it. That does seem like a futile effort, and, but it's one that uh, we have a responsibility to try to keep that transportation, the vital transportation link uh, open. And so that's, what we, uh, we, that's why we, I guess, work so hard to try to do that. The challenge, of course, is that barrier islands move. Highways do not. We spent a lot of money on Highway 12 and we continue to spend money on Highway 12 trying to hold the line, trying to re rebuild it every time it goes to sea. It goes to sea frequently. Rig says there are five more places between Redanthe and Oregon Inlet where new inlets are likely to form soon. 
How soon depends on the size and frequency of storms. And if you want to keep throwing money at them and trying to hold a highway there, you're going to have crisis after crisis, and you better have deep pockets. The way to keep NC-12 open would be to hold back the ocean, and you could imagine how futile that would be for us trying to beat Mother Nature. That water's rough today. The Mack family sees the futility too. What we're seeing are very, very short-term uh, stopgap measures to preserve this area. Stopgap measures their tax dollars help pay for. It just goes on and on and on. We've got to look at uh, permanent solutions to, uh, to the problem that, uh, that we face here. Next, finding solutions to what may be a much bigger problem, replacing the only bridge to Hatteras Island. The impact of that bridge being cut off would impact the entire state of North Carolina, actually. So how concerned should we be about this damage to the bridge pilings? This whole of the pole coming to pieces. You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News. In-depth coverage you can count on. The Bonner Bridge carries Highway 12 over Oregon Inlet. It's how most people get to Hatteras Island and its many attractions. But it's old, well past its prime, and long overdue for replacement. People with different ideas on how to replace it have drawn their own lines in the sand. Man, I can peel off a chunk of concrete here that's four inches. During an inspection, a diver pulls off a piece of one of the pilings that supports the Bonner Bridge. This whole bottom of the pole is coming to pieces. This damage is caused by the inlet's strong currents, which scour sand away from the pilings. If you expose those piles and, and take that uh, material away from them, then it, you know, it threatens the uh, stability of the bridge. That's why the State Department of Transportation inspects the bridge often. After every storm, every time it blows, we're out here uh, checking the bottom, taking measurements. Engineers say this damage found last July is confined to just one of hundreds of pilings and is not a threat to the bridge. But in 2003, Hurricane Isabel caused more serious damage that took four million dollars to repair. And it has had quite a bit of deterioration over its life. It's in a fairly challenging environmental uh, location out there. Stan Riggs says the bridge shouldn't have been built in the middle of an inlet to begin with. Inlets are high energy systems. They're among the highest energy systems we have anywhere, period. Riggs says engineers didn't fully understand that when they built the bridge in the early 60s. There's a nightmarish history of trying to keep that bridge viable over the last 30, 40 years. A 1993 DOT report said the bridge would last until 1999. There are two corridors that are under consideration for the uh, Bonner Bridge replacement. Twelve years later, options for replacement are still being studied. Well, this is a complex project in an environmentally sensitive area and uh, we are uh, studying long-term solutions. But some have another reason for the delay. Bureaucracy. Senator Mark Bassnight, who represents most of the Outer Bank, says enough is enough. It should be replaced, should have been replaced long ago, but it's something that should happen now. The DOT is studying two options. One is a two and a half mile span next to the existing bridge that would cost $192 million. The DOT would still maintain Highway 12 south to Redanthe, an area with frequent overwashes and where new inlets may form. The other option is a 17 mile span that would extend well out into the shallow waters of Pamlico Sound, bypassing the inlet and its strong currents. It would also bypass Pea Island National Wildlife Refuge before rejoining the island at Redanthe. That option would cost $416 million, but the DOT would no longer have to battle the ocean to keep that section of Highway 12 open. Neither plan addresses the problem area south of Redanthe. There is a real split opinion among people here on whether the long bridge or the short bridge is the better option. Think of that day and that time. Senator Bastide says the state can't afford the long bridge. He sees the cheaper short bridge as the first step towards a Florida Key-style series of bridges and causeways to come later. This is a 
question of economy and also access to Pea Island National Wildlife Refuge for the people of this country. In close, on this side of the vegetation? Yeah. Refuge oh, manager yeah. Mike Bryant supports the long bridge, promising that access to the refuge will be preserved. He says the short bridge only seems cheaper. It doesn't account for what the cost of maintenance of Highway 12 for the life of that short bridge. Scott Leggett worries more about the life of the Bonner Bridge. He says the long bridge would be nice, but would be too expensive and take too long to build. He says his real estate business needs a proposal that's real, if not ideal. The reality is, is it, needs a, it needs an immediate solution. Restaurant owner Pat Wolf says the short bridge won't protect Highway 12 from the damage that damages her business. You've got to look at a long-term solution that's going to work no matter how much it costs. <laughs> the Max have heard both sides and stand with those who support the longer bridge. I know it's expensive, very, very, but I think that that is a long-term answer to the problems we face. There may be two sides, but there is one goal reliable access to points south of the Bonner Bridge. Neither side can put it, draw a line in the sand and, and uh, at the expense of the other. Perhaps the biggest challenge facing the Bonner Bridge is not man's battle with nature, but man's battle with man. Some days I'm really convinced that the Bonner Bridge will fall down before they ever agree on how it's going to be replaced, when it's going to be replaced. Right now, that target date for replacement isn't until 2012. Next, when it comes to the shifting sands of the Outer Banks, should we dig in or go with the flow? Ultimately, Mother Nature will have her way. You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News. In-depth coverage you can count on. To learn more about the issues covered in this episode of Focal Point, go to WRAL.com and click on News. If there's one thing that never changes about a barrier island, it's that it's always changing. Old timers on the Outer Banks are old timers because they've learned to live with that. The question is, can other people learn to live with it too? People who need Highway 12 and the Bonner Bridge to be that one constant in a place of constant change. Before Highway 12 was built in the late 40s and the early 50s, there was Highway 101. Which basically translated to, there are 101 ways to get from Oregon Inlet to Hatteras Village in the sand tracks, 101 different sand tracks. Those sand tracks shifted like the island. Some say maybe it's time to let go. Let go of the notion that you can keep a fixed highway on a shifting piece of sand and go back to the days of Highway 101. Back to the days when Earl Foster launched his Albatross charter fishing fleet in 1937. He did just fine without Highway 12 or the Bonner Bridge. All you need is enough. His son runs the fleet now. He remembers the days before Highway 12 and before the Bonner Bridge when people had to come by ferry. And it worked then, but the volume of traffic coming down here now would not be possible uh, with, with the ferry system such as we had in the early days. Those days are gone, and the days ahead are uncertain. There has been significant uh, erosion in my lifetime. Certainly the rising of the sea level is indisputable. And sometime down the road, it's going to change dramatically. Uh, hopefully, but I don't have to watch it. Mary Joy, the lighthouse is moving. Foster has already seen the encroaching ocean force the retreat of this mighty lighthouse and 23 Coast Guard housing units in Buxton. Scientists say erosion and rising sea level are real. But is public policy driven by science? You couldn't take your camera and pan up and down the length of the coast of North Carolina and answer that for yourself. It doesn't seem to be most of the time. I mean, that's just the way that it is. With multi-million dollar oceanfront homes and businesses along the Outer Banks, the financial pressure to keep Highway 12 where it is and keep it open is greater than ever. And I think short-term monetary gain will win out over long-term policy. 
important. We have to get away from the greed factor. Everybody wants to make it now and, and keep it as it is. Well, we can't keep it as it's a changing system. A system that will probably never change back to the way it once was before Highway 12 and the Bonner Bridge. It's kind of like putting the genie back in the bottle now. The people are here, the houses are here, our livelihoods are here. And, you know, like any other locality, we're going to fight for our livelihood. People can live out there. You just don't want to live on that ocean front. The old timers didn't live there. We're asking for a wipeout. And I don't, I, we're smarter than that. We, we ought to be able to do better. We ought to be able to preserve the barrier, let it, let it do, do its thing, and still use it. This is the lighthouse. No one seems to be able to agree on just how to do that. But it seems to be what everyone wants, including the Mack family. Front of the lighthouse again. Who hope to keep coming here for generations of family vacations. I'd like to see whatever, whatever can be done to, to save it, of course. Yeah, so our kids could come back down, you know, when they're older. So. But I mean, yeah, we also realize that this whole place doesn't have much in the way of a permanency to it. I mean, you know, we're, we're standing here on a spit of sand, and that sand is at the, at the mercy of, of nature.